welcome to worship at First Congregational Church. We're glad you could join us today. Welcome, welcome to, to worship. worship. We're happy to have you with us. God is good all the time. Good morning, First Congregational Church community. Welcome to worship on the fourth week of Lent. I'm Pastor Sarah Turlau, and I am delighted that you are joining us as we continue our worship series again and again, a Lenten refrain. I'd like to thank Liberty and Vasil Kolev for ringing our church bell to call us all together this morning. A little later in the service, we will be joined by Vic Mayer as he reads scripture. Betty White is our featured poet of the week. Cindy Rao will be leading our hymns, and we have special music today from Bob and Mary Steenstra, accompanied by our penis, the very talented Kristen Boyce. We also will be visited this week by my friend, the Reverend Cindy Bacon Hammer. She is the moderator of the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches, and she has greetings to offer and some news to share from the NA. And so we can look forward to hearing from her later in the service. Now, March 15th marks the one-year anniversary of our, uh, how do I say it, <laughs> COVID adaptations. One year ago, before anyone had even heard the word COVID, we cautiously gathered in the sanctuary for a prayer vigil, knowing that worship was going to look different in the coming days and not knowing at all how long this pandemic would last. So we lit a candle for every family in the congregation. We prayed for health and safety we prayed for patience in a scary time of uncertainty. We prayed that God would meet us in our fear and in our loneliness that we knew was coming. We prayed for inspiration and discernment as well on how best to care for each other in the coming days. On March 15th, there was a real sense that the church was leaving the building and that it was time for the church to be the church in the world and to show up for one another. And here we are today, still worshiping online, although our church leadership has just set their eyes on our regathering date of May 23rd, Pentecost Sunday. Barring any major backup in vaccine distribution or any spikes in COVID cases in Allegan County, we will be back together again so soon. But this week, I encourage you all to take some time to reflect back on this journey this past year, thinking about parking lot worship and front porch visits and 40-some online worship videos and the text messages and the calls to one another, all of the shifts and changes that we have gone through together. And what a blessing it is to be your pastor. I'm proud of you all, and I cannot wait for Pentecost when we are able to celebrate a new season in the life and ministry of the church and really to hug and share a cup of coffee. I have a couple of community announcements that I would like to share with you all before we get to the good stuff in worship. First, directory photos. I received about 70%, I think, of our congregation's photos for the new directory at this point. Uh, but I will be making some phone calls this week to rustle up the remaining 30%. So if you have not sent a photo in, you will be hearing from me this week in my stern voice. Also, 
It's time for our spring mission partnership here at the church. Our spring partnership this year is Christ to the Villages in Nigeria. This Easter, we will be taking a special collection for their cashew farm project. The innovative thinkers at Christ to the Villages first cleared land and launched this brand new cashew farm in 2019. So a couple years later, this project is still fresh, still growing, literally, and yet it's already bearing fruit for the region. The whole project is part of a a rural economic sustainability effort, bringing some diversity to their economy and investing in something that will last and produce for generations. And it's already providing a lot of jobs to the region. So if you are interested in supporting this project at Christ to the Villages, please send a check to the church with Christ to the Villages in the memo line. And we will get them a donation through the NACCC National Office. They will help us get money wired over to Africa. So please try and have your contributions into the church by April 10th, and we'll make our donation together. All right, now on with our worship service. And as we prepare our hearts and minds for time with God... Let us remember to take a deep breath and know that through the Spirit we are one. We are together. Let us know that God is here with us all. And let's speak together our call to worship. Before we were born, before we took our first breath, before the week started, before the year started, Before we said, I love you, before we said, I'm sorry, before we figured out who we really are, before we figured out who we want to be, before it all, God loved us unconditionally and freely, fully and honestly, God loved us. Again and again, this is where our story begins. Let us worship God. Our story starts with love. So join me in our prayer of confession as we strive to commit this truth to memory. Let us pray. God of love, we forget the beginning of the story that we were made from love to be loved to give love. Instead of rooting our narrative in this goodness refrain of creation, we skip ahead and find our worth at the fall. With Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness, we forget that first there was you and you are love. We forget that out of that love, you created us. We forget that from that very first day, you loved first. We forget because a love like that doesn't make sense to us. Forgive our low self-esteem. Forgive our resistance to love ourselves. Forgive our hesitation to love that even we could be made good. And forgive our tendency to Pass the doubt on from generation to generation. Write a new beginning for us that roots our confidence in your unrelenting love. With hope we pray again and again. Amen. Family of faith, no matter what we do, where we go, or what we tell ourselves, God is love, and God is loving us. Again and again, we are claimed, held, forgiven, and cared for. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, thanks be to God. Amen.
Betty White, and I'm going to read a poem called Hold. If you hold a newborn in your arms, all at once you will understand the crook of your elbow and the cup of your palm as never before. Ordinary curves of the body transformed into a resting place. You were designed for love. And if you're lucky enough to hold a newborn in your arms, and that newborn curls its tiny fingers around yours, making your hands look like the hands of a giant, then time might stand still. And those around you might point and say, look, that little one is holding you back. And in that moment, if you pay attention, you will catch a glimpse of the circle that love was meant to be. God is love, our resting place. With small hands, we hold back. God of the here and now, we have heard the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, time and time again. We have read them on billboards, heard them in worship, and seen them on signs. And yet we know there is a difference between hearing these words in passing and truly, deeply listening. We long to listen, God. We long to hear your truth. We long to know your love. Open our hearts and minds. We are listening. Amen. Good morning. I'm Rick Mayer. If you can't recognize me with my new appellations here, but uh, the scripture reading for this morning is the third chapter of John, verses 1 through 21. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So, it's, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus said. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. Do you not understand these things? Very truly I say unto you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept the, uh, our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen what we have done has been done in the sight of God. May God bless the reading of his words. Good morning, students. I have a story that I would like to read for you today. This is called Love. It was written by Matt de la Pena and illustrated by Lauren Long. This is Love by Matt de la Pena, illustrated by Lauren Long. In the beginning, there is light and two-eyed figures standing near the foot of your bed and the sound of their voice is love. A cab driver plays love softly on his radio while you bounce in back with the bumps of the city and everything smells new and it smells like life. Love too is the smell of crashing waves and a train whistling blindly in the distance and each night the sky above your trailer turns the color of love. In a crowded concrete park, you toddle towards summer sprinklers while older kids skip rope and run up the slide and soon you are running among them and the echo of your laughter is love. On the night the fire alarm blares, you are pulled from sleep and whisked into the street where a quiet old lady is pointing to the sky. Stars shine long after they flamed out, she tells you, and the shine they shine with is love. But it's not only stars that flame out, you discover. It's summers, too, and friendships and people. One day you find your family nervously huddled around the TV, and when you ask what happened, they answer it with silence and shift between you and the screen. In your dreams that night, you are searching for a love that seems lost. You open the closed drawers and lift cushions and empty old toy bins, but there's nothing. You wake with a start in the arms of a loved one who bends to your ear and whispers, it's okay, it's okay, it's love. And in time, you learn to recognize a love overlooked, a love that wakes at dawn and rides to work on the bus, a slice of burnt toast that tastes like love. And it's love in each deep crease of your grandfather's face as he lowers himself onto an overturned bucket to fish. And it's love in the rustling leaves of gnarled trees lined behind the flower fields. And it's love in the made-up stories your uncle tells in the backyard between wild horseshoe throws. And the man in rags outside the subway station plays love notes that lift into the sky like tiny beacons of light. And the face staring back in the bathroom mirror, this too is love. So when the time comes for you to set off on your own, heavy winds will sleep past your building and great gray clouds will congregate above. Your loved ones will stand there like puddles beneath their umbrellas, holding you tight and kissing you and wishing you luck. 
But it won't be luck you'll leave with, because you'll have love. You'll have love, love, love. I hope you know how much you are loved. God made you out of love so you can share love with others in everything you do. There is nothing you can do that will make God love you any more or any less because God has loved you from the very beginning. Isn't that a wonderful gift? Let us pray together. And when we pray during our kids' talk, we do an echo prayer. So I'll say a line and you repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me, even from the very beginning. We thank you for Jesus and his love for us. Help us to know how best to love each other. Help us to be kind. Help us to be good neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen.
I've always had a soft spot for Nicodemus. I'm not really sure why. He only pops up in scripture a few times. There's here in John 3, our scripture reading of the day. Then again in John 7, where he momentarily steps out of the shadows to speak up at a gathering of Pharisee leadership. And then finally, after Jesus has died on the cross, it's Nicodemus that advocated for Jesus' body, that it be taken down and buried rather than just left to hang there. He's a subtle character in the story of Christ's life. He pops in now and again, but in a way almost that makes you think he's perhaps always there, a fly on the wall, quietly watching along, hopeful, interested, but not a gung-ho, in-the-mix disciple. Or maybe I just like his name, Nicodemus. Nike means victory in Greek, hence the shoe company, and demos means the common people, so Nico Demos, the victor of the common people. He's relatable, you know, I like him. But whenever this story comes up in the lectionary, I have to intentionally remind myself that his lukewarmness is a frustration to Jesus, so maybe I should temper my enthusiasm. But consider... Nicodemus was a pillar of his church. He attended temple week in, week out. He kept the commandments. He kept the law. He was a man of integrity and knowledge, so much so that historians and theologians think that he was likely a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the legal governing council of the day. A wise man, an influential man. Uh, This was a group of men who were guided and ruled by the law of God, the Sanhedrin. And it is this guy that arranges a private secret meeting with Jesus. Hidden away at night, under the cover of darkness, Nicodemus arranges to meet a man who has captured his attention, Jesus. A man whose legal interpretations, whose teachings, whose truth was so fresh, so compelling, held such depth that Nicodemus had to meet him. But Jesus was also a man so dangerous and so off limits to the establishment that Nicodemus just had to meet him, but at night. (laughs) The conflicted tone of this encounter is not missed by Jesus. But Jesus was kind enough not to directly confront Nicodemus on his cowardice. Instead, he meets Nicodemus where he's at. He meets him in his earnestness, his searching, and his captivation. And what great wisdom or revelation does Christ have to share in this secret meeting? Verse 3. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Born again is a bit of a loaded term in our American Christian narrative. But this is not a remark about being saved. It's a statement that acknowledges where Nicodemus is at in his life. This Lent, our church's midweek book study is Brian McLaren's new book, Faith After Doubt. It's great. You should check it out. But while we haven't finished it yet, this week our group got to talking about remarkable moments and seasons in our life that moved us along in our faith journey. Seasons that changed what we understand about God or challenged us in a way to ask hard questions of our neighbors and hard questions of our church and hard questions of God. These pinch points that are everything and consuming when you are in them, but pinch points that in retrospect are actually birth canals. They broke way into something new. Perhaps this is where Nicodemus is at. He's right there at the metaphorical birth canal. Verse 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. It makes sense that Nicodemus might be in a season of doubt. 
He devoted his whole life to the law and righteous living. And here comes Jesus, someone Nicodemus himself says, whose teachings and actions are so miraculous that they could not have come from anyone or anything but God. And it makes him doubt the established church. It makes him doubt the work of upholding every aspect of the law. It makes him doubt his fellow Pharisees as they are scheming against Jesus, trying as they might to discredit him. It makes Nicodemus want to give up on the whole scene and come into the light and become a Jesus disciple, but maybe not yet. He's got to let the pinch happen. He's got to let what he knows to be true, he's got to let it deconstruct and pull apart and and be questioned. He's got to let go of the orderliness and the perfection of the law and step into the messiness of relationship with God. Give in to the birth canal. Brian McLaren wrote, It dawned on me there's a difference between doubting God and doubting my understandings of God. Just as there's a difference between trusting God and trusting my understandings of God. As it is written, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. A decade ago, when I was in seminary, I remember it was my Systematic Theology Part 2 class, led by Dr. Charles Scalise. He liked to save a little time at the end of our classes occasionally to pose a pastoral or theological conundrum to the group. He would leave the classroom and walk back in having swapped out his suit jacket for this really humble tan corduroy jacket with patched elbows. And when he did walk back into the room wearing that jacket, we all knew that we were in for a debate. It was simultaneously terrifying and exhilarating in a very nerdy way. (laughs) One such time, he said something like this. Good evening, Pastor. I'm deeply troubled, terribly troubled. I was having coffee with a friend the other day, and he told me all about his preacher's sermon from the last Sunday. He was perplexed about something the preacher said, and now I'm perplexed. His pastor said that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and that was fine. We say that too, right? But then he said... His preacher really drove home that we, not Jesus, deserve to be on the cross. That we deserve torture and pain and death because we are sinful. That Jesus climbed on that cross to pay our price. And only because of that great act of love, only because of that can we have eternal life. Pastor, what did I do to deserve that? Am I really that awful? I never killed anybody. I know I've offended people. I've hurt people. I've lied. I've been envious. I've broken my fair share of commandments over the years. But do I deserve the cross? Do my children deserve the cross? I'm thankful for Jesus. I love our God. But I just don't know about this. I keep thinking about it. It's keeping me up at night. Pastor, please, what do you have to say about this? And then Dr. Scalise, he would walk out of the room, swap his jacket back, and re-enter the room and say, Okay, class, discuss. (laughs) When you get 25 soon-to-be preachers in a classroom, you hardly have to wait out a long pause. And sure enough, arguments for and against penal substitutionary atonement start flying. Someone brings in the doctrine of original sin. People start pulling up a millennia of creeds on their laptop. Someone mentions the 16th century satisfaction theory. Some people are quoting mystics. For a full 20 minutes, we swirl up a rather impassioned theological tornado that engulfs the room. I went to a seminary that had 172 different denominations present. 
we took the idea of multi-denominational and we <laughs> ran with it. But that day in that classroom, we had from Orthodox to Quaker in that room that day. As our class time was running low, Dr. Scalise called on me to jump in and add my voice to the debate. Effort points, right? <laughs> I wanted to dissolve into the walls at that moment. And what did I say? Sir, respectfully, I would tell you that you need a new hobby. The whole room cracked up and Dr. Scalise, but his face lit up for a moment like, yes! But before I could explain myself, the whole tornado got kicked up again and everyone's talking over each other, but I actually meant that. Because seriously, what a theological mess. And that preacher's sermon, laying guilt on thick like that, was out of touch and out of line. Any doctrine that the church can think up to explain God's love is going to fall short at times. Every single one of them. But God help us, we humans, we try. We try and explain it all, don't we? Maybe there are bright moments when we succeed at clasping hold of divine truth and we catch a glimpse of love unveiled and it is always just a glimpse. We need to doubt our understandings. We need to be captivated by glimpses of truth, even when it deconstructs our tidy creeds and statements of faith. We need to be swept away by God's love, and that is hard at times. It's excruciating, but pinch points, doubts, these things are birth canals. They lead us to new spaces of faith. The great Protestant reformer Martin Luther, he wrote a letter to a young colleague who was much like Nicodemus. He was concerned with the law. He uh, was nearly paralyzed in it. He was stuck in it. It was almost as if he'd forgotten how to wonder at God and forgotten about the grace of God. And so Luther wrote this. If you are a preacher of grace, then preach a true, not fictitious grace. If grace is true, you must bear a true and not a fictitious sin. God does not save people who are only fictitious sinners. Be a sinner and sin boldly. But believe and rejoice in Christ even more boldly, for he is victorious over sin, death, and the world. As long as we are here, we have to sin. This life is not a dwelling place of righteousness, but as Peter said, we look to a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, Luther was not advocating that we take up sinning as a new hobby. He was telling us to trust God, which is exactly what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Trust God. God loves you. You are blessed to see his work in front of you. Children of God, how do you feel about Nicodemus? Is he relatable in any way? Have you ever grown weary of religious establishment? Have you ever grown tired of church doctrines or human opinions that try and explain life, explain tragedy, explain triumph, explain sin, try and explain every little thing? At some point, the explanations aren't enough. They just aren't. So I advise you, ask the questions, pray, Shake your fist at God if you need to. Be pinched and challenged and dissatisfied. Our grace is sure. And our God is a big God. She can handle it. Again and again we must be born. Again and again God will bring you through. Again and again live your life. And you are love. Congregation, we've reached that time in our worship service where we lift the prayers that rest on the hearts of our congregation. 
If you have a special prayer request that you would like to have the congregation pray for during the week, pray for during this service, please email me, please call me throughout the week, and we will make sure that those are mentioned at this time so that we can be in prayer for them throughout the week. This week we will continue to pray for a man named Max in his cancer journey. We will be praying for health and wholeness for a woman named Joanne, a friend of Linda Escott. The family of Mike and Pat Gentry have quite a few prayer requests. Peyton is still recovering from her heart surgery. Shelly just had a kidney replacement. We pray for her health, and we thank God for Betty, who donated a kidney to her. So thank you uh, for that organ. And we are praying for Nancy, who is home and recovering from her surgery. So for the family of Mike and Pat Gentry. And prayers for them as well as they are in Arizona traveling. And we pray for our sister Dottie as she prepares for surgery in the coming week. I ask us to pray for those who are feeling the effects of severe depression and anxiety that their worry, doubt, fear, their frozenness in that depression would be eased. And as we mark the one year anniversary of this COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to pray for the end of this sickness. And we pray for all of the helpers out there that are that are serving the community and getting those vaccines out. And as we reflect on this COVID year and all that we've gained and all that we've lost, uh, may God bless you in, in your memories and reflections this week. Wherever you are, as the body of Christ, let us pray. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We thank you for being bigger than our doubts. We thank you for welcoming our questions. We thank you for being with us in pinch moments and hard moments and wondering moments. God, we thank you for being our God. Help us to catch a glimpse of you to step into the light and see your loving work in this world today. And help us in the day to day to seek your wisdom and incitement and understandings in our lives. And help us to keep a sense of awe and wonder alive in our hearts. Lord, hear the prayers of your people today. We pray for those in need of healing mercies. We pray for Joanne and Max and Nancy and Paisley and Peyton. We pray for those who are preparing for surgeries. We pray for Dottie, that you bring her peace in mind and heart. We pray for those recovering from traumatic experiences. We pray for those who are experiencing the bully of depression or struggling with mental wholeness during this time. God, we pray for our church, the local church here in Sagatuck, and we pray for the church universal, that it might thrive and reflect your love into this world that it might heal from this year of pandemic and emerge into a new creation 
God be with us all as we begin to regather and to paint a picture of our church's future. We pray for the earth. We pray that people would be moved to care and take action to protect it. We remember to pray for justice, for systems of racial injustice to be dismantled and new systems of equity to grow. We pray for our governing leaders, local, state, and national, that they would be blessed with wisdom. God, again and again and again, we pray for the end of this pandemic. We thank you, God, for scientists and vaccines. We thank you for delivery drivers and National Guard people and hospitality people working at these clinics. God, we pray for all those who are eagerly waiting that text message or phone call to come and get their vaccine. God, we pray for your, we pray your protection in these lingering weeks and months of this pandemic. We pray for the other 7.5 billion people in this world outside this country who are experiencing di different systems and different rhythms of this vaccine. And God, we pray for the world in this. Help us to come together and to think about our brothers and sisters everywhere. God, I just pray again for our church family that you would hold us and keep us and strengthen our connections. Holy, holy, holy God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And hear us now as we speak together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Again and again, your love remains. Hold us, show us again and again, your love remains. Everything so. Broken, still your love remains. Hi there, I'm Cindy Bacon Hammer, and I am the current moderator of the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches. I want to say hello to you from the National Association. You've been in our prayers and hoping that, uh, that your church is doing well. I have some things I'd like to share with you about what's happening in the National Association. First of all, our annual meeting and conference will be held virtually again this year. We were scheduled uh, to be out, out west, but unfortunately the pandemic has not lessened up enough for us to do that safely. So we'll be meeting online. Unlike last year when we only had time for a business meeting, this year we will have a full conference in two days time, June 19th and 20th. You can register online. There is no cost to attend. There will be workshops. There will be the Bible lecturer, the congregational lecturer, our business meeting, of course, and uh, social time as well as our communion service near the end of our time together. We will also be visiting with missionaries from around the globe and in the United States. So I pray you'll be able to be with us during this wonderful time. Just go to naccc.org 
and register and you will receive one Zoom link for the entire two-day conference. You can come and go as you please, but um, there is only one link to sign in. Secondly, I wanted to tell you about something very exciting that's happened and that happening and that is a webinar series during Lent starting next week Sunday the 14th of March for three Sundays in a row we will be having webinars from the Racial Justice Task Team and the Center for Congregational Leadership. The first of these webinars will be conversations with with some of our pastors of color who will share some of the experiences they have had regarding racial justice and injustice uh, in their lives. We're excited and honored that they would choose to share this with anyone who wishes to participate, anyone who wishes to log in. You just need to go to NACCC.org again under What's Trending and you'll see the webinar series there. It is free but you need to register in order to get the Zoom link to join in. The second of the three webinars will be on how to talk about racial justice uh, within your congregation, within your family, within any group of people. And so we're excited to welcome, to welcome uh, experts in those areas from Olivet College as well as Piedmont College and the Gospel Choir from Olivet College. The third of the three webinars will be uh, the last Sunday in March, and that will talk about, uh, it'll be a panel time, town hall sort of thing, where you'll hear speakers and be able to ask questions back and forth. There's a question and answer time with each of these three webinars, and they will be recorded so you can watch them on your own time. You don't have to be there uh, during the live webinars, but you'll be able to answer quest, ask and hear your questions answered in real time if you do attend on those three Sunday evenings in March. And lastly, I wanted to tell you about the prayer circle that meets each Thursday afternoon. It is at 1 o'clock central, central time, and, um, and uh, according to your own time zone, you'd have to figure out the times for those. But it's a time when clergy and laity, anyone who is interested, anyone with prayer concerns on their heart, can share those, uh, be prayed for, and it's all confidential. We'd love to have you join us for these Thursday afternoon prayer times and uh, hope that that will fulfill a need that you might have during this time where there's been so much stress and so much, so much alone time during this pandemic. We're not all worshiping in person. We're not all able to visit with the people that we love the most. Uh, and so we offer this prayer time as a way to share and to to pray together and to build relationships with one another across the country. So that's what's happening in the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches. There's other wonderful things happening like a new website that will be launched very very soon hopefully by April 1st and uh, there are lots of other resources for your church to use from the Racial Justice Task Team that's also found in Now Trending on the uh, on the NACCC.org website. And just know that you are in our prayers. We hope that all is going well with your church and that if there's anything that you need, any suggestions you have for the National Association, any help that you would like us to know about, we'd be happy to hear from you, either from lay people or your year-round delegate or your pastor please feel free to contact the NA or contact me personally. Again, Cindy Bacon Hammer, the moderator of the National Association of Congregational Churches, and I look forward to hearing from you and hopefully seeing you at our national meeting June 19th and 20th on Zoom. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Our featured art of the week is an acrylic painting with gold leaf on canvas. This is called Light Wave. 
by the Reverend Liesel Gwyn Garrity. This painting was inspired by our scripture of the week, John chapter 3. She has this to say about her work. My first memory of this passage is from writing John 3.16 on my basketball shoes when I was in seventh grade, joining many of my teammates and blending our sports with our faith. I don't remember knowing what the verse really meant, but my display of it was to make a statement about who I was, or at least who I desperately wanted to be. Like the branded clothes I wore, or the way I styled my hair, this was just another way to curate my middle school self-image. I wanted to show that I was good, that I fit in, that I believed in God. Later that basketball season, I added another Sharpie pen tattoo to my basketball shoes, my mother's initial, and the dates of her birth and death marking the 44 years she lived. After her funeral, my teammates added her initial and the dates of her life on their sneakers in solidarity. Now I know that Jesus originally spoke those famous words to Nicodemus, perhaps whispered them amidst the hushed noise of the night. I wonder why Nicodemus came to Jesus in the first place. Had Jesus' teachings uprooted his religious self-image, one carefully curated to project propriety and adherence to the law? Or had death recently left a sharp sting, unraveling his tidy beliefs, creating in him a well of desperate questions about eternal life? Jesus speaks to him with poetry of promise. God didn't send his son to judge the world, but so the world might be restored through him. For God so loved. For God so loves that, like light, God keeps traveling to reach us with that redeeming love. In this abstract painting, The gold leaf marks become like a wave gliding through the cosmos, moving endlessly until it reaches everything. As I think back to those Sharpie pen inscriptions on my basketball shoes, perhaps for God so loved, so that everyone will have eternal life, was the perfect companion to my mom's initials. I invite you to receive or to speak with me this affirmation of faith. We believe God is love, unconditional, constant love. We believe this love exists for all, choosing each and every one of us day after day, again and again and again. We believe that God's love is like a river, Rivers cannot help but flow towards the sea. God's love cannot help but move toward us. We are swimming in it. We believe that God loved first. We believe that God breathed life into dust. We believe that God said this is good. And because we believe that God loved first, we strive to build lives that reflect God's love. May we begin again here. Amen.
you for joining us for worship this week. Please, if you need company, support, community during these unique times, reach out to the church. We are here for you. If you would like to contribute to the work of our church, please consider making an online donation. You can do so by going to Tithely and searching First Congregational Church. That's First 1ST Congregational Church. They also have an app that you can download on your phone if you would like to make the occasional or regular offering to the church. Now let's speak together our covenant that we may end this service in the common voice. We covenant with the Lord and one with another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us in his blessed word of truth. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again. Until God's promised day, in the name of the Creator, in the name of the Beloved, in the name of the Spirit of love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen.